are in the last chapter of James. So take your Bibles. You should have one. If you don't have one, there should be one in the seat back in front of you. And uh, again, James is in the section of Scripture we call the New Testament. And uh, all the way towards the very back. And so sometimes it's a little bit easier to start a revelation and work your way back to some of these. So uh, James chapter 5. Uh, while you're turning there, let me remind you that we're, uh, today is the last day uh, to give towards, uh, towards Nehemiah's family. Uh, just some updates. Um, they just uh, um, Their family is just struggling uh, immensely. Uh, just with, uh, they were struggling to start off with and, and uh, for, from a financial standpoint, and now just even more so with, with the death of Nehemiah. And, uh, so, so we're taking an offering for them last week, this week. Um, and, uh, so, so you have some, you know, today, um, as you're, as we're kind of going through this, um, I know I was kind of convicted as well, uh, as, as we're going to read through this, you're, you're going to see why here in just a minute. Um, but, uh, but part of being a follower of Christ is looking at life through the lenses of the gospel and looking at the things that we do, uh, the places we go. Uh, and ultimately the things that we have. Christ has blessed us. He's, he's, he's given us the ability uh, to, to do some amazing things for His kingdom. And, uh, um, and I told you, I was going to kind of let you in on just some, some uh, a family member that I had found. This is back in the 1800s. Uh, this is my uncle, um, however many greats it is, um, David Stanford, uh, lived in Georgia, uh, and, and while he was there, he was uh, um, very active in his church called uh, Keoki Baptist Church in Columbia County, Georgia. Um, he was referred to as Deacon Stanford. Uh, and, uh, and, and so sometimes, you know, they were like, okay, that's great. But it kind of went on. He was a brick contractor. He was a mason. Um, fired his own bricks. He was a trustee of this church. Um, and when they were going to build a new meeting house, uh, he was the contractor. They said that David, you do this, and um, and, and so so basically, what happened was was uh, in that story, he he not only kind of helped build that new church, but he helped build the courthouse, and and it was just kind of his way of giving back of just what God has done for him. And when we think about who we are, and we think about what we do. Is God the center of it? Is, is Christ the center of who we are and what we do? And one of the great distinctives about coastal life, and this was one that, that really kind of, you know, one that drew my family in, was just everything is centered around the gospel. Everything is centered around the good news of Jesus Christ. And I was just absolutely excited uh that, that first time that, that we actually that you know my family and I we came we visited listen they didn't bring me on I was we were regular attenders we were just we were just we came to because this was our church uh before they said hey Jeff we want you to do this because I kind of kept this this thing of, of me being in ministry a secret for a little while and and so so they, they just but what just drew me to it was the fact that the gospel was the center of everything And, and as I researched more about my family, I found more and more uh, believers within my family because my dad's not. My dad's not. And, and it was one of those things where I'm like, you know, and I knew that my grandfather wasn't. And, and, uh, and, and so I'm like kind of sitting there going, you know, wow, I really, you know, I wonder if this is like a family thing. And, and so as I'm, as I'm going through and I'm looking at all my, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins and Going stretching all the way back, I begin to see many of them actually part of the church and actually giving within the church and being a part of that family and, and serving and working within that. And it just, for me, it just was like that kind of sense a little bit of relief in a way. That okay, that there, there is something to, uh, to this. James... Starts in verse 1, says this, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries, which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments have become moth-eaten. 
Your gold, your silver have rusted, and the rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which have been with you, withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You who have lived in luxury on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure, you have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man, and he does not resist you. Probably one of the harshest judgments against people of wealth in almost in, the, in, in all of Scripture, especially in the New Testament. And ultimately, what I see within this, and ultimately what we, what we find within this, especially if we look at the entire context of the book, is that it's about your heart and where you're at. What is your attitude? Where is, where is the gratitude in, in what God has done for you? I mean, we start in chapter 1, testing your faith. It's all about just, just coming before God and just having a confident stand in what we have. Chapter 2, a compassionate service. This is what a Christian does. Uh, chapter 3, careful speech about what we say. Uh, uh, chapter 4, contrite submission. This is what we feel. And then here, we see this concerned sharing. What a Christian gives. And it's about an attitude. And it's about, you know, you've heard that time, an attitude of gratitude. We hear those great terms all the time. And, and ultimately, this is, let's just kind of dive in. Let's just kind of see what James is really kind of trying to say. Verse 1, he starts up and says, to the believe, it's to the believers and non-believers. It really kind of to everybody. To those who hoard their wealth. And this hoarding leads to miseries. And notice he just doesn't say misery, he says miseries. Okay? Those who are very, very selfish in who they are. Who are all about themselves. Verse 2 and 3, the things of this earth will rot and waste away. Listen, gold and silver really, they don't rot away, but they do tarnish. And they do tarnish to the degree that the actual tarnish ends up becoming very poisonous to the person. And so they become physically, they're worthless. And spiritually, they lead to death. Verse 4. Verse 4 here actually kind of harkens back all the way to Deuteronomy chapter 24, where, where the law kind of commands uh, the, the nation of Israel that, listen, when, when you have day laborers, those people that live paycheck to paycheck, okay, at the end of that day's work, you give them their paycheck. But if you don't, if you hold that back, you're basically leading them to the point of saying, listen, I've got nothing else to live for. Verse 5 talks about those who kind of live this kind of luxurious life and of want and pleasure. That word luxurious literally means to lead a soft life. They're soft. And that's, that's one of those things that a lot of times, you know, we don't like to be called soft, especially if you're a guy, especially if you're somewhat of a teenage guy. I'm not soft, I'm a man. We don't want to be considered soft. And so, so he's, he's literally saying, listen, you who live in this luxurious idea of wanting pleasure, you're soft. You're soft because you're all about you. And then he says, listen, he says, you've condemned and put to death the righteous man, and he does not resist you. Listen, the righteous man knows where his reward is. He knows where his reward is. His reward is not here on earth. His reward is not the things that he has. His reward is eternity. And it's God. And so, so really, ultimately, what we see here is that, listen, it's not about living it up. It's about living it out. It's about saying, listen, no matter what I have, no matter how little I have, my life is for Him. And I'm going to live my life for Him. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. 
Starting in verse 19, it says, Don't store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The psalmist talks about how God will grant me the desires of my heart. And if you listen within that passage in Psalm 21, I do believe, that it was all about God giving the victory. That the desire of, of David's heart was that God would get the victory. That God gets the credit. And so in our prayer life and the things that we pray for, the, the question comes up is like, okay, am I actually praying for what God wants? Or am I praying for what I want? Am I praying the promises of God? Am I praying that, God, you've promised to sustain my life and to, to guide me and to direct me and to, to be with me all the days of my life? God, I give you the glory for that. Store for yourselves treasures in heaven. That's where we spend eternity. And ultimately, how we spend eternity we can almost look back and we look at this and it's almost determined about how we live now. Remember, James talks about, he, he, he talks about very, very sternly. He says, listen, show me. You can, you can speak words of faith all you want, but I'm going to show you my faith by what I do. That I'm actually going to live my faith out. I'm going to live it out. I'm not going to live it up. I'm not going to try to, to kind of, hey, I got one life. I'm going to live it up. I'm not, you know, that whole YOLO, the you only live once kind of mentality. It's the mentality of, you know what? I'm going to live my life out. I want as many people to know about Jesus as possible. That's what I want. That's the heart that Christ desires. Is that that person that treasures people coming to know Christ. Great place to start is this Friday night. You know, invite, invite your neighbors. Invite you know, those that have kids and, and, and come. And they're going to, they're gonna, you know, yeah, we're going to watch a good fun movie, but, but we're going to share the gospel. And we're not going to be ashamed of it. Because if we're ashamed of the gospel, if we withhold that, and we, we kind of say we keep that for myself, what are you ultimately saying about Christ? You're telling that other person they're not worth it. That they're not worthy of your God. Here's the thing. None of us are worthy for our God. We're not. Also, it's not about tithing. Okay? Listen, it's not about tithing. If you actually go and research in the Old Testament about tithing, you, you, and, and you see all the offerings that the Israelites had to give over the course of the year, you're looking at over 25% of the income. Not just the 10%. And so it's not about time. It's just simply about generosity. It's just simply about being generous of what God's blessed you with. And listen, it's not just money. It's not just money. It's, it's what we have. It, it's, you know, maybe, maybe we've got an extra room in the house and we've got a family member or we've got a friend that's, we, we got a friend that's struggling that needs a place to stay. That's generosity. Maybe it's, a family that has lost a son who's drowning. You're like, you know what? I'm at Publix today. I'm just going to get an extra $25 gift card for him. 
Maybe it's the, 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 the senior citizen that's down the street that just really can't do much in their yard and you go over and you mow it. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. Maybe you've got some extra income. Maybe you've got a little bit more. And you say, you know what? There's this ministry or there's this place that is sharing the gospel and that is that the gospel is going forth. And you know what? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going to give. Second Corinthians chapter 9. And I'm just, I'm just going to read it to you. It says, for, for it's superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry of the saints. For, for I, I know your readiness. He's talking to the church of Corinth. The church of Corinth is ready. They're ready. They're prepared uh, to, to give. Of which I boast about you to the Macedonians, namely that in Achaia, which has, has been prepared since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I have sent the brethren in order that your boasting about you may not be made empty in this case. So that, as I was saying, you may be prepared. Otherwise, if the Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not only speaking of you, we will be put to shame by your confidence, by this confidence. So I thought it necessary to urge you, brethren, that they would go on ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift, so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetedness. Now I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must do as, as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having sufficiency in everything, you may have abundance for every good deed. You cannot outgive God. You can't. You cannot outgive God. And I'll tell you why. It's called the cross. You can't trump that. Bill Gates, Donald Trump, they can't, they can't pay an, any amount of money. to go beyond what the cross did for us. That's what it all circles around back to. It circles back to the cross. And listen, you can't reap what you don't sow. If you don't reap any, if you don't sow anything, you might don't expect to reap anything. Listen, if if you don't if you don't Students, if you didn't sow in the classroom, your report card didn't reap very well. If, if we don't do a good job at work, the boss comes in and says, sorry. If we don't, if I don't sow well within my family, I don't reap my kids coming to Christ. We need to have a generous outlook on what we, ha what we have. It's not about what we want. It's about what we have. It's about what God's already blessed us with. And listen, you may be sitting there, you may open up your checkbook, and you may be sitting there going, there ain't nothing there. That's fine. But you got other stuff God's blessed you with. God may bless you with some time. God may bless you with a talent. God may bless you with, 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 with an extra room. God may bless you with, with, with an opportunity to, to share in something else. And it's, listen, it's just simply giving from your heart. It's from your heart. It's just simply saying, God, you've blessed me. I'm going to give back for the sake of the cross. What we have been given is to advance the gospel. Listen, the, the Great Commission is not, is not something that you can choose not to do. It's not an option. 
We are commanded to go and to share Christ with the nations. So, what have our offerings done in the life of Coastal Life Church? Apart from the building and worship services and the people to do the work, okay? Apart from all that, paid rent for one family. 59 people accepted Christ. Uh, one, a 103-year-old uh, person last, last week accepted Christ. Uh, 19 people baptized. That alone should be enough for us to say, okay, I get it. But, began a relationship with uh, the Courageous House. Uh, to uh, conducted a nationwide seminar on how to present the gospel. Uh, met with, uh, with, with, with two different, different groups, um, uh, Youth with the Mission and, and uh, um, I don't know which other one this is. Um, 25 pastoral counseling sessions uh, provided counseling for six marriages in trouble, 18 struggling individuals, a teen and parents, uh, paid for professional counseling for three people, helped a family move into a new home, helped a new family find a rent house, uh, spent over $3,000 in missional support, spent over $1,000 in benevolence support, provided paid work opportunities for 12 people who needed income, rolled out an idea to help begin disaster relief recovery efforts across the U.S. All for the sake of the gospel. 59 people within this last month accepting Christ in Coastal Light Church should be enough. Should be enough. But here's the thing, in the life of the church, we do so much more. We do so much more. And here's the thing, you're the church. You're, you're the church. You're it. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on Rich to, to, to kind of close out. And uh, Rich has a, a, a friend and uh, is, is, I'm just going to kind of keep his friend's name anonymous uh, just for, for that sake. But, uh, but anyways, uh, this friend um, was struggling um, immensely. He needed a place to stay, and Rich opened up his home. He says, you can come stay for a little bit. And he did. And Rich just kind of had some opportunities to share the gospel and, and opportunities for uh, for, 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 for this man to kind of see Rich's life. And here's the thing, just simply opening the door, just simply offering to open the door spoke volumes to his friend. I had a school this year for Operation Christmas Child. They collected over 100 shoeboxes. This is like a group of students. There's only like, like 20 students in this club, and they collected over 100 shoeboxes to give towards Operation Christmas Child. Had another club this year during FCAT week uh, take it upon themselves to say, listen, you know what, let's pull our money together as a group of teenagers, and, uh, and let's do something for the teachers. And, and so, so they, they went together, and they, they, put, they put these little candy bags together for all the teachers during FCAT week. And each one had like a little, like each candy meant something. Like one of them, the one that stuck out to me was Smarties and says your little tag on it says you're smarter than you think. Than you think. That's giving, gen that's generosity. That's living out the Great Commission. It's more than just simply putting a dollar in an offering plate. It's your attitude. And so this is what it all boils down to. It all boils down to the gospel. And the gospel is this. God made this world. He made it all. And he made it perfect. And he made it just the way he wanted it to be. Our story is that we kind of come along and we mess it up. We, we're selfish. And we want to do things our way. And we want it our way. And Ultimately, we tell God no, and we shake our fist at him. And because of that, our sentence is death. It's going to happen. We're going to die. 
But what happens after that's what's even more important is where we're going to spend our eternity. But because of our sin, because, because we can't, we owe God a debt we can't pay, what God does is He provides a way for us, and He provides that way through His Son. He provides the way through Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to God except through Him. And so, so with that, He becomes our perfect provision. He provides the way in which you and I can't. We cannot pay our way to heaven. We cannot earn our way to heaven. There is nothing we can do to get there other than accepting the perfect provision in Jesus Christ. When we do that, He gives us the keys to the kingdom. And we're able to enter in to His kingdom, which is right here, right now. And you know what? Eternal life doesn't start when we die. It starts right now. It starts the moment we enter into that relationship with Him. And then we're actually able to live the life that He originally intended for us to live. A life in love, a life to be identified with our maker. Because listen, our, listen, we're separated from God. We don't have an identity with anybody. We kind of live around in this selfish world. And we're not identified with our maker. But when we enter into that relationship through Christ, guess what happens? We, we know our maker. We finally get to know our maker. And we have his favor. We have the favor of the God of the universe. And we have eternal life. And so right where you're at, this is what I want you to do. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. There's no one looking around. It's just me. And, and I don't know where you're at. I don't know what's going on in your life. But if what I just said clicked, and it made some sense, and you get it, you understand that you're separated from God and, and what separates you from God is that selfishness, it's that sin, it's the things in your life that, that, that go against God. Um, and you get that. And you understand that there's nothing you can do to get your way to Him. He provides the way. He just simply says, trust in what my Son has done for you and live your life according. And it's as simple of just simply admitting that you're a sinner. Confessing that to God and committing your life to Him. And so this is what I'm going to do. If that's you, and you can honestly say, yeah, I get it, I understand it, and I need that. I need Jesus. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say a prayer. And there's, there's no magic in these words. There's no power in them. Um, but... but but if that's you and you're ready to do that and you can honestly say, you know what, I need, I, I need that forgiveness. I need Jesus. I need that change of life and, and, and I, need, I need salvation. Would you just simply just pray this in your heart? God, God, I'm sorry. God, I know, I know I'm a sinner. I, I know I've messed up. I know I've done things wrong. I know they ultimately go against you and I know I'm separated from you. God, I trust Jesus. I trust that what he did on that cross, he did for me. He paid the debt that I can't pay. And God, I ask you, I ask you to begin to change me. Help me grow in the relationship with you and, and so I can actually live life. And my life is made complete in and through your son, Jesus.